Thank you, Linda. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you all today. Um, the book that serves as the basis for this webinar is Reclaim, Space in an Emerging Generation, which you uh, know is available now in print and in ebook versions from judsonpress.org. You can see the link there. This webinar will share personal stories drawn from interviews with young adults who were church active as adolescents and have found their way back into active involvement in congregations through a variety of paths as adults. For some, there was a time away. For others, it was a more fluid movement, perhaps to a different congregation uh, due to some physical relocation or something like that. While we listen, listen to their stories, I mean listen deeply behind the words that they use and reflect on what we might be hearing. These stories provide for us this beautiful, rich tapestry of thick, rich descriptions, which are the gift of research of this type. Those descriptions are analyzed, and they point to some key steps that congregations can take toward greater faithfulness as we seek to welcome and partner with young adults in our congregations. Now, before we get started, let's take a quick poll. I wonder how many participants are part of congregations with one or more missing generations. While you're responding to that, I can tell you that nearly every leader of a mainline Protestant congregation in the US, lay or clergy, can resonate with this issue. All right. And I wonder also how many have watched faithful adolescents as they disappear from the church. Move into young adulthood and seem to move away from the church. There you go. Statistics confirm that millennials and a significant number of other generations are missing from our churches. We who care about the church fear what missing generations may signal. And we often find ourselves wanting to do something, but not knowing quite what to do. Reclaimed offers a vision for reclaiming those missing generations and the promise that they offer. Now, this research would simply have been a nifty academic exercise if it weren't for the fact that I am personally invested in it. You can see me there playing spoons with some of my youth who are now grown up. I care deeply about the youth and young adults who've been part of youth groups and congregations I've pastored. I care deeply about this issue of missing generations and congregations because I love these youth and so many others like them. I was driven to do this research out of a sense that an injustice was taking place, that I could somehow do something about. According to the findings of the research detailed in Reclaimed, the church serves young adults well when it invites them into real relationships with people of all ages, gives them opportunities to use their voice and vocation or giftedness, to serve others, gives them space to work things out on their own time while maintaining the connection that caring friends have when one is struggling. And the church does not serve young adults well when it fails to live up to its own call, to love God with everything it has and is, to love neighbor as self. You might be able to tell from my passion about this topic, this is more than just research for me. My faith demands that I use my voice to help the voices of young adults be heard. Now, if you've done even a quick Google search, you know that there are many, many answers out there, simplistic answers mostly, for those who are seeking to address these issues. But simplistic answers to complicated questions fall short. In Reclaimed, I sought to offer a sustained look at faith in the context of the real lives of actual people. I invite you to join me as we enter into those real lives of actual young adults to listen deeply to their stories, 
and find the beauty in their struggles and the very real faith that is passionately present there. I hope in these stories we will encounter that we seek to understand the faith of this generation and that it will cause our faith in this emerging generation to grow as well. So let's start off with a story. Let's hear from a few young adults and learn some more. The first story I want to share with you is from a young woman named Sierra. Obviously, I've changed the names of these uh, young adults so that uh, we can protect their identities. But this teenager, Sierra, found that singing was the most fun she ever had. Every time she sang on Youth Sunday, the congregation celebrated her gift and praised her beautiful voice and poised delivery. She had the opportunity to take voice lessons and found herself wanting to sing something a little more challenging. Even her voice teacher assured her that she should have no problem singing the repertoire with the adult sanctuary choir. So Sierra approached the choir director one Sunday and asked about singing with the adults enthusiastically sharing her voice teacher's endorsement. She felt like a door was slammed in her face when the choir director emphatically declared that no children were permitted in the adult choir, period. She needed to wait her turn. Here's another story, this time from Bethany. Bethany was stunned. Back in worship at the Christmas and Easter and when my parents visit Church of Her Twenties, the any church there, she found herself dumbstruck at the way that she had just been treated. She had been engaged in worship on this Sunday when she attended, this time on her own, sensing that she just needed some peace and that church had at least been good for that for her. The pastor, a 40-something woman, invited the congregation to join her in reading the scripture text for the day, which was projected on the screen. Bethany found the scripture intriguing and wanted to read it again for herself, so she called it up on her phone to have another look. She found a woman in front of her, turned around, and chastised her loudly enough for everyone around her to hear. That's just disrespectful. The woman, whom she didn't know, admonished assuming that Bethany was just messing around on her phone instead of paying attention. This next slide says, does this resonate with you? Young adults like Sierra and Bethany are in our communities, if not in our congregations, where they might long for the kind of relationship with a community of faith that we can provide for them being their journeying partners through life's ups and downs. When we talk about making space for them, and this is an important thing to take note of, when we talk about making space for young adults, we're speaking or behaving as if the church wasn't also theirs. Like it belongs somehow to us, those who've been around longer. In the process of coming to understand something about what it means to be an adult in the church, we had some help from uh, some scholars who've done a fair bit of research in this area who can give us some insights into what it means to be an adult. So here's some, here's some definitions. Being an adult means be aware that we compose our reality, that we put together our own lives and compose our reality or decide what they mean, to participate self-consciously in an ongoing dialogue toward truth, that we're a part of deciding along with those around us in dialogue about what is true for us. Finally, to be able to sustain a capacity to respond, to hold in tension those disparate aspects of ourselves and others. In other words, that we can distinguish between ourselves and others and determine what part of the world we control and what part of the world others control. Growing into adulthood means holding all of these realities in intention, both for others and in our own lives, and realizing that we all, all of us, 
need a lot of grace. So the path from adolescence through emerging adulthood, adolescence being the teenage years from 13 to about 18 when legal adulthood begins, uh, through emerging adulthood, which is something like 18 to 25, we'll talk a little more about that later, and into young adulthood might seem straightforward and linear, but a quick check of our own paths likely reveals that that's not exactly the case. Human development seems anything but linear, which makes understanding it a bit tricky. Once upon a time, there was a more standard script, perhaps, where you went to high school, or college, got a job, got married, had a baby. The marks of adulthood in that scenario seemed fairly clear. But today, the script is a little different. And if that's the script that you grew up with, where you knew you were an adult because you graduated, got a job, got married, and had children, then this path to, young, path to adulthood today might seem a little confusing. Today, emerging adults represent an in-between stage, legally adult, but perhaps still dependent on parents for significant aspects of their lives, self-determining without being self-sufficient. It's confusing during this period of life because sometimes we're told by our culture that we are adults in some ways and are not in others. For example, you might be chronologically an adult and still live at home. At the same time, you might be a student in college where your parents are paying for your college but need your permission to get their your grade reports. It's a confusing time, but it can also be a time of unparalleled freedom to explore both vocation and meaning in ways that haven't been possible in previous generations. Now on the faith side, we have the benefits of some large-scale research to give us a picture of adolescent faith in the US. You can see the statistics on the slide uh, from this National Study of Youth and Religion. What we learned from this is that more than half of mainline Protestant teens attend worship, attend church more than half the time based on survey responses that were gathered in this that major national study. And, and they say that if youth identified that they would attend even more often if it was entirely up to them. Lots well, of good news. But the maybe less good news is that teenagers were pretty inarticulate about what they believe. And they described God as something of a cosmic vending machine who really cares a lot about how they feel. The terms the study used were moralistic, therapeutic deism. At some point in adolescence or early adulthood, people face challenges. Uh, scholar uh, Sharon Parks calls those shipwrecks. And in the face of those shipwrecks, young adults are sometimes told to just believe, when in fact what they need to do is have space for big enough questions that will allow them to explore how their faith applies to these very real, challenging life circumstances. Exploring questions of faith may not have been something that prior generations experienced. The very act of questioning may be seen as threatening to them. But in the worst case, grown-ups who have loved and supported these young adults may distance themselves from the young adults who most need their friendships. Our churches, it seems, have done a less than consistent job of helping young people to know and experience the God they claim to believe in. This comes partly as a result of a broken understanding of youth ministry that sequesters and warehouses young people in programs that play games, plan trips to amusement parks, certainly. A shift in that understanding has been on, underway for some time in most congregations youth ministries. There's some helpful research in a book by Dory Baker called Greenhouses of Hope, where she expands the perspective of the role of a congregation, envisioning it as a hotbed of growth and nourishment that's alive with possibilities. 
one congregation in its research began identifying God moments together. Times when you can't say, you can't say exactly what happened, but something happened. Something godly, something spiritual just took place. In that congregation, the youth were engaged in church-sponsored mission trips to Appalachia, and their lives were so changed by those experiences that eventually the adults got a little jealous and wanted to get involved as well. In this congregation, the youth led the adults in reflecting on issues of justice and privilege as they prepared those adults for mission trips to Appalachia like the ones they had taken. Congregations can indeed be powerful spaces for youth and young adults to grow into an understanding of where their passions and their gifts can intersect in a faithful response to the needs of our world. Now, as I analyzed interviews for the commonalities among participant responses to faith-fostering experiences in adolescents and young adulthood in their congregations, four themes began to emerge. Identity entanglement, still small, grown-up voices and vocations, the tangible grace of real relationships, and faithful fallowness. Each of these themes seem to be a milestone or a marker along a journey I found myself calling a way back home into active engagement in congregations for these young people. So let's take a few minutes and explore these themes in a little greater depth through the stories told by these young adults themselves. In my congregation, in my conversations with interviewees, Lisa and Kathy, I learned more about the role of faith and church involvement as an integral part of identity formation in their lives. I came to call these identity entanglements. For Lisa, identity directly connected to the church and youth group of which she was a part. It was her highest priority, she says, and she even set her work schedule around the church activities as a team. Kathy described the church as central to her adolescent life, and it was a place for her where she formed her closest friendships, her boyfriends, positive and important adult relationships. She says, Kathy says, there was no possible way I could have been more involved or invested. At the extent of her personal and emotional and spiritual commitment could not have been greater. Lisa and Kathy both spoke of something that went way beyond just attending, as they formed their identities around this key aspect of their lives. Church and their faith were intrinsic to how they understood themselves. Let me tell you a story from Lisa's experience. Uh, Christian Camp had become a powerful part of her identity as an adolescent, so much so that she discerned the vocational call to camping ministry. Becoming a part of that uh, camping ministry became an important next step in her life, the next most faithful step. She went on to a Christian college where she was preparing for a ministry in this area. While she was there, about that same time, she became more fully aware of her own identity as a lesbian. In the process, she came to understand that these two were just a part of who she was. She was a person who understood herself as called to ministry. It also just so happened that she found herself as a person who was called into relationships with people of the same gender. It's just who I was, she said. It's kind of like a life-giving interconnectedness that I mean when I talk about identity entanglement. Lisa's self-understanding was and is in the context of the congregation. Now, the idea of identity entanglements has implications for how congregations relate to young adults. Paying attention by learning who young adults are becoming is an, a critical part of our understanding how we can help them take next steps, recognizing that their identities and their commitments are still in formation. If you wonder why sometimes they don't follow through, it's because they're still figuring out who they are. They're still in formation. 
Let me give you some examples of the ways that we can pay attention to the development of young adults in our congregations. Calling someone we knew as a child, we knew them as Becky, without paying attention to their preference now as a young adult to be referred to as Rebecca. It reflects an unwillingness to recognize their evolving identity. Treating emerging adults as peers, the peers they are becoming for us as grown-ups, may mean that we invite them to call us by our first name, when previously we were Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so to them. We can also create safe enough spaces for young adults to speak up, not as informants for their generation, but as real people with individual gifts and commitment. There's a simple way in which rite of passage, when they become 18, something as simple as just giving them their own directory entry helps us to open doors for them to grow into their identity as the adults they're becoming in our midst. Remember earlier we said churches can be greenhouses of hope and can provide a way back home through faith-fostering experiences. In exploring how congregations do this, I heard from study participants about ways in which churches nurtured their still small voices and vocations. Again, let's hear from some young adults' own stories. Finding voice and vocation, sometimes a critical part of early adulthood. The church, in some cases, but not all, can play a, con play a role, provide a context for the shaping of a vocation. We've all understood that there are some ways in which our society shapes what a life well lived looks like. Let me offer you an example from the research of Brian Mahan in a book he wrote called Forgetting Ourselves on Purpose. He writes how troubling it was for a young woman who planned to go into the Peace Corps to find that at the same time she also got into Yale Law School. And all of the people around her were appalled that she would even consider going into the Peace Corps because the life script of success told her, tells us all, if you get into Yale Law, you go to Yale Law. But there are alternate scripts provided by our faith that allow for a sense of call to override ambition. These counter-narratives give meaning to our deepest passions, and sometimes they are the life-giving element that we can offer to young adults as they pursue their vocations. Let me tell you a story about Bill from my research. As a child, Bill was shaped by the conversations in his family about injustice and inconsistency in the world, conversations that explored various responses to these situations that were prompted by our faith. As he grew into adolescence, Bill found himself embroiled in a constant battle with the unfairness he found in the prevailing culture, even getting a little lost in his anger sometimes when he felt disempowered by, I would call them broken adults in his school or community. This threat of taking action on justice issues that had been so important in his early identity was something that helped him to come back to himself as he vacillated in late teens and early 20s. It was a thread that helped him to find himself back into active participation in the community of faith. Eventually, led him to seminary for a couple of years and then on to law school. Last year, he took down a corrupt and abusive juvenile justice organization in his state, driven by his faith and his passion for giving voice to those who are marginalized by society. Another young adult who testified to the ways in which she found her still forming an increasingly mature voice and vocation is Dana. She grew up in a small membership congregation in a little town in the western Midwest. She's active in her congregation, uh, in, involved in camp in the region. She describes herself as more than just a youth. That's how she understood herself in the context of her congregation. By that, she meant she took her membership in the congregation seriously. She showed up at business meetings and expected to contribute. She served on non-youth committees. She invested herself as a 
as what she called a real member of the church. Well, she went away to college, and one weekend when she was home from college visiting her family, she learned that the congregation had called a meeting while the pastor was away on vacation. Essentially, she says, it was a meeting where dissatisfied members would be able to get an audience to trash the pastor's work and character, fomenting an ouster of this pastor with whom they disagreed. Of course, she attended the meeting. Dana recalls being appalled at how badly these grown-ups were behaving, not at all like the Christian elders she believed they were growing up. Dana finally understood that being chronologically adult didn't necessarily mean maturity in faith. She mustered the courage to call out those grown-ups for their behavior and for their unfaithful tactics. Dana identifies this incident as pivotal in claiming her voice, and it accelerated her vocational quest. James Fowler, renowned for his work in describing stages of faith, puts right the mistaken conflation of vocation and work. Fowler says that vocation, which is seen as partnership with God on behalf of the neighbor, constitutes a far more fruitful way to look at the question of our specialness, our giftedness, and our possibilities for excellence. Vocation is a critical way that people of faith make meaning of their lives. Even less than ideal congregations can create space for youth and young adults to discern vocation and find their still small grown-up voices. We can flip the script by valuing a diversity of generations in leadership. We can flip the script by offering alternative ways of understanding success in our world. We can flip the script by inviting people into leadership based on gifts and not longevity or seniority or power in the church. We can flip the script by creating space at business meetings even for smaller discernment groups for deliberation on issues so that all voices can be heard. Now remember when we said this research found that churches could be greenhouses of hope, providing a way back home? Another aspect of this that I heard is something I termed tangible grace in real relationships. The study participants' stories help us to see why this tangible grace or sacramentality was so important to them. Now, coming from a Baptist church, I realize that the term sacrament is loaded with doctrinal differences, but it's really the word that I want to use in place of tangible grace. At its most basic level, the term sacrament refers to a means of grace, a human practice that makes tangible God's grace in our world. The sacramentality of real relationships more adequately describes for me the power of genuine relationships that I heard in my congregation conversations with young adults. By real relationships, I mean to indicate something that goes way beyond superficial, goes way beyond niceness, to relationships that make a difference in the lives of young adults. Those young adults valued honest and messy friendships that grow among people who take risks together, invest in one another. These are the kinds of relationships that made the difference in the lives of these young adults. The young woman that I interviewed, Kathy, describes the quality of her congregation. She says, those families that were part of our congregation, they enfolded us. Now, given that Kathy's own parents were important role models for her, her description of these other sort of unrelated adults I think is important, is significant. Looking back on that time in her life, she says she always felt loved, as if the community understood itself as having a purpose in the lives of other uh, young members. Another young woman, Susie, observed that it really sent a message to her as a teenager when adults without kids, uh, without kids in the youth group, helped out with youth events. By and large, youth uh, study participants pointed to the way they felt valued, included, um, and the ways in which these things helped to shape their self-understanding. There's three key aspects 
I think, to this idea of tangible grace in real relationships. One of them I take from uh, some authors uh, I appreciate very much. You know, the book Live to Author, Dory Baker and Joyce Van Mercer describe this uh, practice of companioning. It goes beyond just being there or being so physically present. It involves intentionally journeying together, journeying together, going somewhere together on purpose. That's kind of like what a congregation does. And when youth were included intentionally in that journey, they felt valued and invested. It became a tangible way in which they experienced the grace of real relationships. What Baker and Mercer call companioning reminded me of another idea that I had first encountered in the writings of a Russian developmentalist whose name is Lev Vygotsky. He talks about a zone of proximal development, the area around a person, between people, between what a person can do alone and what that person can do with assistance from someone who's already learned how to do the task or skill. Those who are just figuring out how to adult need others around them who have themselves worked through some of these things and can assist those emerging adults in taking next steps. One of the study participants that I spoke with um, gave illustration of this idea of scaffolding that I think is particularly useful. She was doing some cleanup and uh, in a disaster area after a flood, and an elderly woman who lost everything to that smelly, nasty river muck helped her to reframe what's important in life. When asked what this woman would like those volunteers to try and retrieve, Andy imagined that she'd ask for them to find some valuables, maybe important papers, family photos. Instead, all this woman wanted was a plastic nativity set her husband gave her for their first Christmas together. She got it all figured out, Andy reflected. In that moment, that woman provided scaffolding for Andy to take what were in the crucial next steps of faith. Tangible grace through real relationships came in a variety of forms for my study participants. Maggie grew up feeling that there were few adults she could model her faith after in her home church. For her, simply living within the strict moral codes of the church led her to say, I could do grown up better than that. But the grown ups she met at church camp and professors at church related colleges she attended provided those role models for her. Sharon Parks talks about the way in which these relationships can help young adults to find their way. She, she talks about the, the steps those young adults can take when they're in the presence of mentors who can help them grow in faithfulness. Maggie talked about how this time for her in her life was an experience of the regular and marked response that she felt and people around her felt to God's grace. Faith became more integrated in her life and less something that she just did every week, maybe, and twice on Sundays when she went to church. The church of Maggie's adolescence maybe wasn't the church that could help her take the next most faithful steps she needed to, but as she moved into young adulthood, she found another congregation where there were grown-ups who could help her ask bigger questions and take those steps. For Holly and Craig, the idea of mentoring communities resonated with them deeply when their experiences of young adulthood. As adults in their current church, both Holly and Craig separately shared how they made an immediate, albeit somewhat artificial, connection to the members there because many of them were alums of the same college where Holly and Craig had met. That made joining the church feel like coming back home for them. So much so that they changed careers in order to stay in that same city rather than relocate and have to change churches. The church had become a vitally important part of their lives, a mentoring community in their lives. They hope that that will be the case for their children as well. Again, 
scholarship points to the importance of real relationships through things like mentoring communities. My conversations with young adults indicated that it's not just being there, but the quality of being there that matters. One of my favorite thinkers, Maria Harris, proposes that everything in the course of the church's life teaches. Preaching and hospitality, all of the things that we do, whether or not we're intentionally teaching, all of it teaches something. Seen through this lens, those people on the sidelines of the congregation who may not think they're teaching anything, they're just wrong. How these non-teaching adults live their lives matters more than they could ever imagine. So paying attention to our role in extending tangible grace and fostering real relationships means these things. Let me just highlight a couple of them. Modeling mutual respect across generations. Expecting older adults to care about the church and about its thriving beyond their own lifetimes. Creating safe enough space to try to discuss difficult issues. Trusting the God of our forebears to lead us to continue identifying those that God has gifted in the next generation. In practical terms, this means things like encouraging young adults and getting to know them, not just as others in the congregation, not as children, but as friends. It means offering learning opportunities across age levels based in interests and passion, so people have an opportunity to get to know each other. It means fostering those friendships across generations. Now, our premise has been that churches could be greenhouses of hope and could provide a way back home through these faith-fostering experiences. A final and critically important aspect of what I heard from young adults was about the faithful, fallow, times in their church involvement. There's more than meets the eye in the times in between young adult involvement and congregation. If we treat them like they've, quote, left the church, we're missing out on an opportunity for an important, uh, an important kind of ministry that we can have with that. Now, while a handful of the young adults I interviewed found their ways to churches all along the journey from adolescence into young adulthood, most of them described a period of time when they were not active in a congregation. Some chose this time away, while others became de-churched. All along the way, I heard stories of deep and genuine faith. Faith they needed some time away to explore. We might think that when folks are away from the church, that they are simply not interested. But what I found was, they were searching. They were finding space. They were asking deep questions. There was, indeed, faithfulness in the fallow times. One of my study participants, Kathy, describes the lovely freedom that she felt during this time of her life when she didn't attend church. She started Sunday slowly drinking coffee, reading the New York Times. It was everything she'd seen in movies and in television. These, these times for her became like Sabbath in her over-busy week. Still, she says she missed the poetry of the liturgy, a sense of transcendence and mystery that she'd experienced in prayer and communion, the opportunity connect, to connect with something bigger than herself. At several points during this fallow time, Kathy found herself drawn to the local agency that provided meals for those in need wherever she happened to be living at the time. One of the steps of living into her grown-up faith was recognizing her passion to provide food for hungry people. She told me that it became more important than any church had been in her life, the soup kitchen work, that there was none of the ego or pride or morality that had become toxic to her in the church of her adolescence. Things were very simple. She cooked and people had something to eat a very important aspect of her development. Now, a fallow period is not necessary for faithfulness. Andy, Laurie, and Dana from my study gave witness to this. 
but it does seem to be far more common than not. Let me tell you one other story. Morris and Tanya found themselves de-churched. Tanya interestingly asked, what's wrong with us that we don't fit in? Both had a brief period when they were away from active congregational involvement in college, but then they got engaged and got married and attended the church where Morris had grown up. They were both involved, Morris in music and Tammy, Tanya, I'm sorry, in children's ministries. And a pastoral change, unfortunately, is what provoked their um, feeling of being de-churched. Morris describes that he remembered inclusive language in worship while he was growing up and began to hear only exclusively male language in his congregation. The most important expression for Tanya was the pressure she felt to teach a particular curriculum or from a particular theological perspective. Morris's parents stopped attending the church and that they had been invested in their whole lives, and eventually Morris and Tanya did too. They started to gather together as part of a potluck with a bunch of others who had been de-churched from the same congregation, until eventually they realized that what was happening at those potlucks was church, that they needed to just acknowledge that and to develop a congregation that would be uh, meaningful to them all. So this new congregation, because of its size, also evoked in both Morris and Tanya the desire to be more real about their faith. For Tanya and Morris, finding a place in this congregation of their young adulthood took a detour, but it also led them to a place that was deeper and more a part of their lives, even more um, entangled with their identities. Another of us that my study participants, Maggie, used these words to describe the transition time, how it functioned for her. She says, without stepping away, without leaving the church of my adolescence for a while, I would not have ended up in the church in my young adulthood, with which I feel so pleased. When the individuals I interviewed spoke of a fallow period, it was typically during this time we now term emerging adulthood, beginning around 18 can continue into the mid to late 20s, depending on the person. It makes sense to me that commitments of families of origin largely influenced by parents' authority and values would be reevaluated once young people begin composing their own identities and realities in a newly emancipated adulthood. Newly aware that they get to construct their own meaning, they might well find themselves searching for new ways to express and live out their faith. When I use the term faithful fallowness, I mean to indicate the evidence that young adults are indeed engaged in meaning-making work with regard to their faith, even if it's not evident on the outside. My interviews seem to indicate there are many, many reasons why emerging and young adults find it necessary to become less active in a local congregation, to judge them for their absence without understanding is both unfair and unkind. The young adults I interviewed sometimes tell of individual members of faith communities from earlier in their lives who tethered them to their faith during those emerging adult years. It almost seems as if some communities, some faith communities, reject youth back when they feel like these emerging adults and youth are rejecting them. This issue of rejection, of youth walking away from their congregation, it's a tricky one, but we need to pay attention to it. So tethering young adults in the fallow times of their lives means these critical things. I just want to point to this one. Connecting with younger friends outside of the church, much like you would with other grown-up church friends. Wouldn't it be interesting if we just developed friendships that kept us in touch with one another, maybe through social media or texting or calling one another. That way, even when young adults aren't coming to worship, aren't showing up at church, there's this relationship that tethers them 
back to their congregations. In practical terms, these are some of the things you might try. Be present. Recognize younger friends as more than their age. Respect their church choices. I think all of these things help them as they grow into adulthood. Now, from my con conversations with formerly church active adolescents who are engaged in communities of faith, here are some things we learned about youth ministry. Youth ministry needs to move beyond silly games and thin theology and serving soup. These things are not bad, but they don't create space for big enough questions in the lives of youth. Youth Sundays, where the youth uh, dress up and play church for us so we can say how cute they are, that's merely tokenism. It doesn't go far enough to cultivate deep and abiding faith in the lives of those youth. You'll remember that we found through the interviews with our study participants those four factors and how critical they were. Young adults highlighted for us what I call identity entanglements, the identified still small voices and vocation, I, under identi identity entanglements, things like wondering aloud, teaching them to understand that they can take a perspective on an issue, or that any given issue has lots of perspectives, providing them with language to talk about what they're experiencing, creating a space that welcomes questions. All of these things are crucial. Congregations can help foster a sense of a growing investment in the faith community by inviting young adults, emerging adults who are searching for voice and vocation in some of these ways, by allowing them, not even allowing them, but inviting them, compelling them to participate on intergenerational committees and task forces connecting their passions with the needs of the world, recognizing where they are already invested in the world and can connect that investment with their faith. Stories I heard through the interviews made it clear relationships matter to adolescents and young adults. Not just any relationship is transformational. Beyond being real, which is very important, what we're talking about here is the call of others, myself and others in the youth ministry community to connect with people, to create actual relationships, and frankly, to make it easier for youth who have been a part of our youth ministries to see the path into adulthood. Many times, youth ministry looks very different from adult programming in the church. Developing this continuity is crucial. Things like inviting young adults to share music or involving their music from conferences and camps, other meaningful aspects of their lives to provide a point of connection in the congregation. Rites of passage can be very useful as youth and young adults find ways to bring who they are into the congregation. Finally, there is this matter of the fallow periods and this time when youth and young adults just need a little space to get to understand who they are, what their voice sounds like, what they're committed to. The critical importance during this time period of tethering individuals and creating experiences in the life of youth and young adults that will tether them it's, I just simply can't overstate that. It's crucial. Checking in with them, staying connected. Authenticity, in this case, is absolutely crucial. Reframing the mindset of those who are older so that they understand that it's their privilege as folks who are already committed to faith, to make space, to create opportunity for people who are seeking, who are trying to find their way this matter of older adults in the congregation, the fact is we live longer. And as we live longer, these older adults have opportunity as healthy and active folks to continue in the roles that they've had in congregations for many more years. And as we think about 
what it means to be involved in the congregation, we need a paradigm shift. We need new tools to think about what it means to be invested. Even just thinking differently about what it means to have a role in leadership in a congregation, that it's something that we should only hold on to while we allow it to shape us and teach us what it can. That, that this matter of leadership in the church is less about getting it perfect and more about learning something or growing through it. These are crucial ways in which we reframe what we do in a congregation. So in order to live into the role our congregations have as greenhouses of hope, providing a way back home through faith fostering experiences, congregations need to pay attention to these four key areas that we've talked about today. Paying attention to each is crucial. I hope you found it meaningful to take a step back and see anew through the lenses of our study participant stories why these four areas were so important to them. And I hope that you've been able to imagine next most faithful steps that you and your congregation can take to reclaim this emerging generation. We have some time for questions today. I want to make sure that we have some space for that. Let me just remind you, uh, Reclaimed on the left there, uh, Reclaimed is, is Faith in an Emerging Generation, another volume I've uh, authored with Judson, Fostering Faith, Teaching and Learning in the Christian Church. You can find me on Facebook, my author page, Janice Jansen, author, educator. You can find the books at judsonpracks.com. Linda, do we have any questions? Thank you, Denise. So at this time, um, if you have a question for Denise, you can either type it into the question box or the chat box in the control panel, or you can raise your hand by clicking on the icon um, next to your name. Okay. Denise, at this point, it does not look like anyone has any questions. However, if you, you do, um, after reviewing the uh, webinar that I will send either later on today or tomorrow, um, you can reach out to me or you can reach out to Denise and ask any follow-up questions. Denise, I want to yes, thank please, I'd be happy to. <laughs> I want to thank you very much um, for taking the time to uh, present Reclaim today and I want to thank all of our participants and I do encourage you to go out um, and check out Reclaim Faith in an Emerging Generation. You can uh, go out to judsonpress.com and uh, if you order online you'll get a 20% discount off of the retail price. Also I'd like to let you know that um, you can check out our other upcoming webinars. We have a Women in Ministry series in April and a Church Leaders series in May. And you also can get more information about those by going to uh, judsonpress.com and clicking on the News and Notes section on the right-hand side of the website. So again, thank you all very much for attending and the webinar itself will be coming shortly. Have a great day, everybody.